So next, I'd like to talk a little bit about ritual, right? Which, as I say here, is acts performed relating to um, beliefs and ideas, both supernatural and natural. Not all rituals are supernatural in nature. Not all rituals are about um, the divine or uh, um, uh, about powers and things like that. Um, but they're, they're, they're these acts that are routinely performed um, that relate to these various cultural processes and ideas in our lives, okay? And so what I'd like to do is to talk about um, um, some historical ones and some anthropological ones, but also some, some that maybe you have in your own life, okay? So part of ritual, but again, not in all rituals that, that are not related to the supernatural, is magic, okay? And... Um, uh, uh, magic from the book, it says, can be defined as practices intended to bring supernatural forces under one's personal control. Now, again, I have a little bit of an issue with this. Not, uh, I would define magic um, as not control, but is really about influence. Magic is a way for us to influence supernatural forces, powers, or beings in order to convince them or encourage them to act in certain ways. I don't think it's about control all of the time. It is about um, an attempt to access that power that is beyond natural power, okay? Um, as I say, it's more about a request for help or for guidance or knowledge. I think control is a very um, Western uh, way to think about it. We're here to control this power. Most magical practices and most religious practices recognize that we can't, we can't control something this big, okay? Um, but rather that we can, we can um, hope that it will intercede. Now, I mean no offense, but a really good example of this is prayer. Right now, linguistically, we we before, I'll come back to prayer in a second. Linguistically, we use the term magic to describe the other, to otherize people, right? Magic is something that they do. It's not something that I do. It's not something that we do, right? Um, um, we view it as a little bit silly, okay? Now, I would actually disagree with that. I think that it is, by this definition of magic, um, right, this, this idea that we're going to try to get supernatural forces to um, either under our control or, as I would say, right, intercede for us, help us, grant us knowledge, give us guidance, those kinds of things. That's really what we see. Most people recognize that this great spirit or this deity or whatever, I can't control it. I'm just a man. Um, I'm never going to control the thing, but I, I might get it to help me, right? And so that's what prayer is, right? It is asking the divine to... Um, protect me, to help me pass this exam, uh, to let the hurricane not blow my house over, things like that. I know and I, that I can't make it do that, right? When individuals are using magic, they know that they're accessing a power beyond themselves. Um, and so they approach it oftentimes, if you look at magical practices um, in the West and in other parts of the world, they are approached with a great deal of humility because they know I, I don't have power over this thing, right? This is massive. I don't have, I, I can't tell it what to do. So this definition from your book about bringing it under your control, um, I won't say that doesn't exist because certainly it does. There are times when certain magical practices are trying to force um, a spirit, right? Um, or, or a force to, to, to uh, bend to my will, to bend to the person's will. But a lot of times these things are approached very, very differently than that, right? It is instead a request. It is approached with humility, not hubris. It is approached um, with an understanding of one's own position in the pecking order of power, okay? So I, mm, I don't know about that, right? So uh, this is what I say, right? The attempt to compel supernatural forces, powers, and beings to act in a certain way. And some of the earliest examples of this are actually in cave art from around the globe. This is what we call imitative magic. And imitative magic is the idea that like will influence like. That if I have one thing that is like something else, then it will influence it. You see this in certain... Um, 
um, ethnobotanical studies, like so the study of wild plants as medicine, for example, um, not to be crass, but all over the world, um, if you have a plant that looks like, say, male genitalia, um, you find that that plant is supposedly uh, helps with male virility and um, um, erectile dysfunction and that kind of stuff, even though in many of these cases we've studied it um, in the lab and it doesn't have any active chemical compounds that are going to do anything like that. Um, others, it'll have uh, other plants that maybe the fruit or the seed or the leaf, it looks like the kidney or it looks like uh, the heart or things like that. Oh, well, then that plant helps the heart because like influences like that plant helps the kidney because like influences like or it looks like um, plants that maybe have like flowers for example that maybe look like the eye you, you'll, you'll find around the globe that they that helps uh, improve your vision or or correct cataracts or those kinds of things right um, likewise even today you'll find in some parts of Southeast Asia um, tragically, things like elephant tusks or rhino horn, they're very, very hard and, and, and strong. And so those things um, poached from these endangered animals and then ground up and consumed will help, like I said, with like male virility. In some places, you'll see that they are supposed to help with like osteoporosis and bone density loss because that thing is really hard and I need my bones to be harder and therefore like influences like, right? But as I said, cave art is probably the oldest example of this in the world. Um, when you look at like Lascaux in France and other places, uh, rock art in, in South Africa, different, different things like that. Um, in this case, the imitative magic was about hunting. Again, these things are from the like uh, uh, late uh, Paleolithic, you know, uh, or excuse me, early Neolithic, right? Uh, um, uh, anywhere from thirty to fifty thousand years ago, in some cases, uh, a little bit older. Um, nonetheless, uh, um, many of these are about hunting practices because at the time, all human beings were these nomadic. Um, foraging societies that were out there uh, hunting every day. And again, um, these people had a really healthy way of life, as I've mentioned before. Um, forager populations tend to be much, much healthier, healthier than farming populations because they have um, a much more diverse diet, um, and which is why they tended to be taller, they tended to live longer, stuff like that. But it does have its struggles, okay? Um, if any of you hunt, you recognize this. Um, you know, uh, there's no guarantee that you're going to get something, right? Especially at various times in the year, such as the dry season or the winter or, you know, this kind of stuff, depending on the geography of where you are. It's hard to make a living hunting sometimes, right? Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's tough. And so you want everything in your corner, right? And so much of this cave art often shows um, individuals hunting animals successfully. And so if I draw the warriors and the hunters of my tribe, of my band, of my village, successfully hunting these animals, then that's going to influence those hunters when they really do go out to hunt those animals, right? And this cave art is absolutely stunningly beautiful. We can tell, um, exactly what animals these are from gazelles to deer to lions to uh, water buffalo to you know animals that are now extinct but we know them from the fossil record and we're looking at it going yeah this really lines up um we even know like for example um i have a book i can't remember it was a husband and wife team they're um uh they're they live in uh central africa and uh travel around i think they live in south africa now but they're um european ancestry uh, but they were both born and raised there, and they wrote a book about all of the different representations of animal tracks, what's called spore, uh, animal tracks on these carvings, and they're so accurate that we can literally measure them and look at them and go, you know, that's a kudu, that's a, you know, whatever. And so um, they were very, very precise in many of these drawings because, again, 
if I'm if I want this to be successful, if I want this magic to work, then I need to make sure that it is very, very accurate showing the exact animal that we're going to find, the exact animal that we're going to hunt, and the exact animal that is then going to comply with this magical practice in the hopes that um, it, it surrenders itself to us, right? Now, of course, that doesn't always work, but um, there is... You guys are going to watch a video about this. You know, there's there's always a reason why, right? Uh, there's always an understanding of, you know, um, why didn't the magic work? Well, uh, in the West, we have the expression of God moves in mysterious ways, right? Why don't things work? Well, maybe I didn't do it right. Maybe I wasn't pure of heart. Maybe I wasn't, I didn't perform the ceremony in the proper way. Maybe I've done something else that canceled out the ceremony, right? Again, supernatural by definition is beyond natural law and so um, uh, if I'm talking about a chemical experiment in the laboratory I know why it didn't work I didn't measure that chemical right I didn't have the Bunsen burner at the right temperature whatever it is this is kind of not subject to that in many ways right um, another example of this is the Venus figurines from the upper Paleolithic um, these are figurines that have been found literally all over Europe and these are some examples of them right now um, the idea behind this is, is is complex like what do these represent um, they are found over thousands of miles they are found over m different centuries right this is a, a these are figures that share a tremendous amount of commonality but at the same time also display a fair amount of diversity, but they're, they're close enough that we can tell they are related to one another. It begs the question, what are these, right? And this is something that is very open to interpretation. Um, is this art? Is this uh, pornography? Is this religious? We do argue that this seems to be religious, and the reason why is the context in which we find it, which um, in archaeology, uh, context is everything. Everything is about context. Where you find this um, tells you a great deal about it, okay? There, you know, you can find a, 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 a glass or a goblet. If you find that in a bar, that tells you something different than if you find it in a church. One is for just hanging out with your friends and getting drunk, and one is for participating in religious ceremonies that are solemn and important and have a lot of history behind them, right? So we find these things in kind of the context of other uh, icons and religious uh, depictions um, in homes. We also find them, oddly enough, buried in agricultural fields. And we find them in bedrooms and things like that. Um, there's a lot of scholarship on this, and I don't, I don't want to take up too much of your time. So let me just say, what we argue is that these Venus figurines, as they're called, right, named after the Venus de Milo, which of course is literally millennia later, but um, um, is that these represented fertility. Um, the, they, these objects are quite clearly handled based on the polish or the patina um, of, the, of the stone that, that they're made of. They were obviously being handled a great deal um, because the, the oils in your hands and stuff rub these things smooth in a way that just like if you threw it in a creek, it wouldn't just, you know, get smooth in the same way or whatever, like a river stone does. Um, and so we think that these, we, we know that these were handled a great deal and we think it may be related to fertility because all of these women, um, it is quite typical for them to appear fairly pregnant, um, that their breasts are enlarged, their tummies are sticking out, um, these kinds of things. They're, they're quite detailed in many, many ways, showing female genitalia and the, the, like the outer labia and the clitoris and all of this kind of stuff. They're very, very detailed about those things, um, though they do not ever have faces on them. Um, meaning that it represents something, but it doesn't necessarily represent a specific thing. It doesn't represent a specific deity, but rather um, something more generalized, we think. And so this may have been about fertility, right? To, to make sure that um, women got pregnant, to perform rituals about, again, handling them and performing a ritual that 
um, moms will be healthy, that babies will be healthy, that pregnancies will be safe. Uh, again, pregnancy can be a fairly dangerous time um, for, for many people. Unfortunately, there are, are still far too many maternal deaths that happen every day in the 21st century, um, much less in the, paleo, the upper Paleolithic, right? Um, so, so we argue it has something to do with this. Um, we do know from other studies and things, uh, I mentioned that this, this, these were sometimes found out in um, agricultural fields. Again, we do know from other studies it was quite common for animistic peoples to view the Earth as female. You and I here in the West still say Mother Earth. Why? Because the Earth is seen as fertility. The Earth is seen as feminine because things grow from it. Things grow in it, right? The Earth is giving life to things. And so that means in our uh, cosmological interpretations, the Earth is thus feminine. And so uh, it may have represented sort of an Earth goddess, right? And why was it being buried in agricultural fields? Well, if this is in part about fertility and moms and giving birth, well, then that also applies to the harvest, doesn't it? Once we start farming later on, once we start planting later on, um, this might be something about uh, making sure that the, the earth is fertile, that the rains come, that Mother Earth supports us, you know, those kinds of things, right? So again, based on all of this, we, we think it's about um, these religious, excuse me, ritual and ceremonial practices. Okay. Uh, I was talking about rock art before. This is some more rock art here that's actually found in Iswatini. Um, this is a picture that I took when I was uh, doing research there a few years back. Um, and um, this depicts, uh, I was saying, I was talking about imitative magic with hunting. Well, this actually is a depiction uh, much later on um, and uh, very ancient now. Um, but this doesn't depict successful hunting, but this depicts successful warfare. Um, what's interesting about this, and, and it's so old, it's difficult to get some good pictures of this, but um, the, the peoples of this, the southern tip of Africa look very different than the peoples in Central Africa, historically speaking. So, for example, uh, the Kung San, the Siswadi, Sizulu, uh, all of these people typically have um, uh, more reddish skin than the very, very dark skin that you see of individuals that are coming out of the more equatorial zone of Central Africa, right? Like we talked about. Um, likewise, their hair is different, obviously very different cultural practices, things like that. Well, many millennia ago, there was what is referred to as the Bantu invasion in South, uh, Southern Africa, which was Bantu farming people, Bantu speaking peoples who were farmers, right? Bantu language family that moved into this area as their population grew, looking for more fertile land. And historically, these individuals were um, uh, the, 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 the peoples of Southern Africa were foragers. Well, the depictions on this wall, it depicts many, many things. It depicts all kinds of animals. It does depict hunters hunting those animals. Uh, it depicts big herds of animals. Again, let's make sure the herds come back when the rains come. But it also has a large scale depiction of a war, of a battle. And this is one of the panels from that. And it shows um, people that are drawn with red skin, more reddish skin, fighting against people that are drawn with much, or not reddish skin. Let me rephrase that. I'm sorry. It depicts um, people that are drawn more red, red pigment, and then it depicts them fighting against people that are drawn with a darker, almost black pigment. We think that this may in fact represent the oral tradition that was passed down of many thousands of years ago of these Bantu speakers invading. Okay, And so what you see here on the top row is four warriors and others are depicted with spears, others are depicted with uh, bows and arrows. These guys are actually depicted with this um, weapon that they use. They would have a stick, sort of like a hatchet size stick, you know, maybe a foot and a half long. And on that, they would tie strips of leather. And at the end of the leather, they would put um, metal if they had it, if not uh, uh, rock, 
uh, very, very sharp pieces of rock. And so it's like, if you're familiar with European medieval weapons, it's like a flail, basically. It's an extremely dangerous weapon. And they would base, it's like a whip. They would, they would swing it at people. And you had um, anywhere from four to five to six um, long leather, long leather straps. And so you could keep people at a bit at, at a distance and whip them with it. And it's literally like five or six knives that just rake across your face, rake across your body. Um, again, a very effective weapon causes a lot of damage, these kinds of things. Right. And so we think that that's actually we know that they had that weapon from the historic period. I mean, you can find some in museums and stuff. Um, Europeans described them when they showed up. And we would argue that this is exactly what we're seeing in that picture. Now, underneath that, you might see two sort of very weird looking people birds, right? Um, this sort of were vulture um, thing. I argue, based on my research, that what you're looking at here is the Sangomas or the shamans. In Southern Africa, they have a shaman, shaman tradition. And again, shaman is a term that is used, is, is used incorrectly a lot. Um, shaman is a, um, a word that was used by indigenous peoples in what is now Northern Russia that was mistranslated by a German uh, social scientist in the 1800s, right? Um, and so when we say a shaman, right, we're, we're talking about a religious practitioner, uh, but uh, in a culture, uh, but uh, really we're talking about an, an indigenous uh, religious uh, uh, leader, uh, indigenous uh, uh, healer, those kinds of things. It, it gets applied broadly. But for um, the peoples of Southern Africa, they use the term Sengoma. There's different kinds of this. There's an Inyanga, and an Inyanga is really like an herbalist. They're experts on herbal medicines. Um, Sengomas do that some, but not as much as Inyangas. Sengomas instead uh, are much more the religious practitioners, and they, they're the ones that will go into a trance, sometimes by drinking alcohol, sometimes by smoking marijuana, which is indigenous here, uh, sometimes by smoking tobacco, um, sometimes by, and this is probably the most common actually, is by um, going into a trance by exhaustion. So they will stay up for like 24 hours straight, dancing, beating a drum, uh, uh, singing, um, hyperventilating themselves, this kind of stuff. And after uh, 15, 20, 24 hours of doing this, they'll fall into a trance um, where they're able to contact the spirit world, where they're able to move between worlds, where they're able to leave their body, this kind of stuff. And sometimes they do this to speak to your ancestors to find out what's wrong with you. Sometimes they do this to speak to their own ancestors, to look into your body, to diagnose illness or disease, which you will then go to, this is the Sangoma, you'll go to an Inyanga to get the right plants to cure that disease, right? So it all kind of fits together. Um, but part of what they also did is they would go into these trances before battle. And they would leave their bodies. And the Sangomas that I interviewed, and I interviewed a lot, um, the Sangomas would tell me that you can leave your body and you can fly. And, but you don't exactly become a bird, right? But you're no longer a man. And they said that you're like a man with wings. What I think we are seeing here is a depiction of that. Um, these, you can kind of tell that the heads are sort of tilted down. Many of these Sangomas would stand on a hillside. It's a very hilly part of the world. They would stand on the hillside looking over the battle. They would go into this trance and then their spirits would fly up, at which point they would perform magical rituals to attack the enemy and the spirit of the enemy of whoever was coming. And so what I think you are actually seeing here is a depiction of, of, of exactly that, right? Uh, of, of what's going on there, right? So uh, it's kind of cool. It's kind of fun. I thought you guys might dig seeing it. But uh, again, this is imitative magic. Like influences like. Let's draw our warriors kicking ass. Let's draw our Sangomas going into trances and attacking the spirits of our enemies and us winning this battle, winning this war. And if we draw this right, if we perform the correct rituals, um, if we do the right practices, then that's exactly what's going to happen um, on the battlefield out there okay so when we talk about uh rituals part of this is rites of passage okay 
A rite of passage is just when you are moving from one social status to another. It is when you are moving from um, one position in society to a different position in society. And in all societies, all of them, um, you will perform rituals for that movement from one social position. And there, this is, this is called a, a, a rite of passage, right? These rituals that help you pass from one place to another, okay? And in all rites of passages, there are three stages that we see over and over again, which is separation, liminality, and incorporation. Sometimes it's written as reincorporation, right? Um, but what this means is that um, whenever you go to a rite of passage, you have one social position. You will be separated from society. Brief, long, it depends. You are going to be separated from society, right? And sort of cut off from them. And then while you are separated, you are in a liminal state, which is just a fancy way of saying that you don't really have a status at that point. You're no longer your old status. You've been separated from your old status, but you've not yet moved to your new one. And so you're in a liminal state, a state where the normal things don't go on, the normal positions don't arise, this kind of stuff, okay? Um, and then there's going to be reincorporation, which is that you all are brought back into society. Again, you're incorporated or reincorporated. And at that moment, then you achieve this new social status, right? Now, this is actually a depiction of, um, in South Africa, of uh, the Zulu culture. And in the Zulu culture, um, they have a male rite of passage and initiation ritual, okay? Um, not all cultures have this, uh, uh, but they are quite common around the globe, particularly for men, because males, uh, to put it bluntly, females have an initiation ritual going from girlhood to womanhood, which is the men arc, uh, which is their first menstruation. Boys don't really have that. And so to go into manhood, you have this rite of passage for manhood. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, I think it froze there. Um, and so a good example of this is the Zulu. Uh, the Zulu have this process where when a young man uh, is becoming a man, uh, and again, this the age can vary greatly, um, but um, when a young man is moving into manhood, um, um, they will go through this rite of passage. Now, how old makes you a man? In our culture, we have this very abstract distinction of 18 years old. Uh, again, that's it's kind of a meaningless thing. It's also kind of odd because it's like, well, you're an adult at 18, except you're not really because we still don't let you buy pistols or uh, liquor um, or rent a car <laughs> you know, uh, or, or these kinds of things, right? You turn 18 and like, okay, you can buy rifles, you can join the army uh, and you can watch pornography, but you're still not able to really do a lot of things, right? Depending on the culture, Usually uh, adulthood happens when you're capable of doing the things that you need to do. And so I often say like it's it's the idea of this rite of passage is that you move into a new status. That new status has new rights, but that new status also has new responsibility. You get rights, um, R-I-G-H-T, right? Not R-I-T-E-S. You get new rights so that you can fulfill your new responsibilities, right? We have disconnected rights and responsibilities in our culture. I want all the rights, but I don't have to do no shit about it, right? I want to be able to drive, but I don't have to pick up my little brother, right? I want to be able to vote, but I don't want to have to take responsibility for the political process and involvement, right? Uh, so those kinds of things, right? So it depends on how old they are. For a lot of the Zulu, traditionally, it was like 15 or 16 years old because that was how old... Uh, about the age that you could uh, hunt, that you could hunt and provide for your family, right? So, um, so we see this kind of come about there. Um, when you were going through this right, you would uh, the, for the young men, they would be separated from the community. When you became a man, what they would do is they would separate you, and they would um, literally build like huts out in the woods or, or out, out out in the mountains and stuff. And the young men would go there and, and be separated from society. They'd have no contact with their family. While they were there, they were in a liminal state, right? They were 
Um, no longer boys, but they weren't yet men. But when you're in a liminal state, the normal rules don't apply. And so um, other men would come and sort of tell them how to be a man. And they will tell them the advice and the secrets of masculinity and, and all kinds of different things. They will also go through a trial, which is um, they would be circumcised, right? So these young men would uh, be circumcised at that time. This can be a very dangerous thing because, um, you know, you you get circumcised, they, they just use a knife, they cut the foreskin off, uh, they do not use anesthetic. Most of these things are not cleaned. When I was working in, in Iswatini, or Swaziland, uh, in, it was the summertime, which was uh, our summertime. That's the most common time to do this. Um, it's the dry season, and so these young men are not needed to grow crops and stuff. And so that's when this usually takes place. Um, and just the summer that I was there, I saw one news report that at that point, 35 young men had died because they had bled out from the ceremony, right? But it's also a test to make sure that you're tough enough to be a man. Right. The reason that they are covered in all of this white ash is because it demonstrates that they are no longer people. They are no longer boys, but they are not yet men. They are in this liminal state. So they're not even really people at this moment. But in order to prove that they can be incorporated into society as men and therefore wash off the, this white ash and show that they are human and, and, and people and men, um, they have to go through this ordeal. And so they will be circumcised in this tent, or excuse me, in this hut. And then they have to, of their own power, walk back to their homes. And, and some young men die and don't make it, right? Uh, and the idea is that you were not strong enough to kind of do it then. Right. And so it can be very, very dangerous. But when they get back, they will be incorporated in society as a man. I will often critique us here in the West. Part of the problem that I think we have is that uh, most of you are over 18. One or two of you uh, are, are in you know, high school dual enrollment, but most of you are over 18. And yet. And so you're an adult, except do we really treat you like that? Um, I know many individuals that turned 18. You're an adult now. But they were still living at home. They said, yeah, I still had a, a curfew. I'm an adult, but I still have to be home at 10 or 11. Or, uh, you know, you're an adult, but do we really treat you like an adult? Do your parents speak to you as an adult? Do your neighbors speak to you as an adult? Do your professors treat you as an adult um, who has the rights to make your own decision, but the responsibility to live by those actions? Oftentimes, I argue we don't. Um, the, the benefit of a rite of passage is that it is very clearly defined, right? You are no longer a child. You're an adult now. I will treat you as an adult, but you have to act like an adult. Um, and I think that we don't do that. We don't do that. And it becomes very easy then um, for younger people, young adults, to not act like an adult because we have robbed you of the opportunity, right? Um, it has been taken away from you. You know, um, and so so I think that we have some things to work on there. Right. Uh, psychologists have done a really good job demonstrating that uh, the way you treat people uh, makes it easier for them to act that way. Right. Uh, that if you are treated like uh, a criminal, it becomes easier to act like a criminal. If you are treated like you're irresponsible, it becomes easier to be irresponsible. But if you are treated like a responsible adult, it suddenly becomes much, much easier to act like a responsible adult, okay? So let me give you some examples of maybe your own life where you see rituals taking place um, and this idea of separation, liminality, and, and incorporation. A great example, and one that I hope all of you are gonna get to experience in the not too distant future, uh, and, and, and I'll help any way that I can with that, is graduation, right? Uh, all of you are in college, and, and, and hopefully very soon you're gonna be experiencing um, um, graduation, right? Graduation is not a religious ritual, and I want to give you a couple of examples of this, right? Because we often talk about rituals solely from a religious standpoint, but I want you to understand that ritual is an important marker in our lives. Not every day of your life is exactly the same. Not every day is a carbon copy. Some days are special in all cultures, and those days shouldn't be treated like all the other days. And one of those is graduation, right? So during graduation, 
you are separated from society. So when you go to graduation, your family doesn't get to walk with you. Um, your mama don't get to hold your hand, right? You are separated from the rest of society, okay? And while you're there, you're in a bit of a liminal state. You have finished your degree, okay? But you are not yet considered a graduate, okay? You are neither not college educated and you're not college educated. You are liminal, right? You are between a social status, okay? Because this is a social status. College educated is a big social status in our country, right? Socially, economically, politically, you name it, right? It's an important part of it, okay? So um, you are separated and in that liminal state, backstage in the auditorium, you know, uh, or whatever, right? And then you go through a ritual ceremony, okay? You go through this ritual of dressing in a certain way. Again, in that last picture, you might have been looking at, oh, that looks so strange that they're all wearing this white, you know, clay and ash covering their whole body. I would argue that's no different than us wearing these odd sort of ceremonial robes that no one wears anymore, that wearing these odd little hats that literally nobody wears anymore, right, with tassels hanging off of them, right? None of it's odd, none of it's normal. This is just part of the ceremony. It is part of the ritual. Um, likewise, just in that last picture, you saw the fact that everybody's covered in white ash and they kind of look identical. So too is the point of this, is that you will all dress exactly alike and look kind of identical, right? Um, you will go through the ceremony of people telling you how to be an adult now, how to be responsible, right? Just as those young men in South Africa got lectures from village elders about what it means to be a man, how to live a good life. So too, if you've ever heard a commencement speech, right? This is what it, this is my advice for you moving forward, being an adult, being successful. Um, these are my great insights and secrets. I am offering them unto you, right? And you'll get that from guest speakers and you'll get it from the college president and you'll get it from the vice president of academic affairs or the dean of students, right? It's really not that dissimilar than this Zulu ritual in South Africa, right? And then each of you will undergo your own ordeal. It's a much more mild one than getting parts of your body cut off, but you will be called up onto the stage. You will be presented with a diploma. You will shake hands with people. Um, they will congratulate you and you will exit. Once all of that takes place, you will actually move that tassel from one side of your head to the other and that tassel movement demonstrates that you have now been uh, 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 transferred into your new role. You've been incorporated into your role in society as a college grad or reincorporated in society, right? And that's the point when they say, everyone, congratulations to the class of 2020. And we all cheer and we're all really happy for you. And we really are. Uh, and and you've, you're a graduate and you've, you've moved, right? But I hope you see that there's a tremendous amount of similarity here. We're not talking about something uh, with the, the Zulu. And we can talk about so many different groups from the Quechua to the Aymara to the whoever, right? And all of these different groups that do these things that is very, very similar to what we do and us to them, right? So, yeah. Another one is a wedding, right? Weddings are a, a, a really cool uh, example of this, right? Uh, again, like it is often religious, but it doesn't have to be. Um, there is this idea of separation, liminality, and re and incorporation, right? So then, you know, you are getting married. Your social status is changing from single to married. That's a big deal. Married status is universally higher than unmarried status. Uh, married status is universally more respected in all societies and cultures than unmarried status is. Um, and so you are oftentimes put into a liminal state, particularly for females in our culture, right? The night before you get married, you are not allowed to see uh, the person that's going to be your spouse. You have separation. You can't see each other. It's bad luck. It's terrible. Bad things will happen. Well, well what exactly? Hell, I don't know, but it's bad, right? That is supernatural thinking. I don't know, but laying eyes on each other will make bad things go down. That's supernatural thinking. It's not necessarily religious thinking, but it is supernatural thinking, right? So we need to separate these individuals. Um, you will then be uh, put in a liminal state. You're not single anymore. You're not yet married. Oftentimes, like for both men and women, you will have 
all of your groomsmen or all of your bridesmaid or all of your family will stay with you the whole night. Even if normally you live on your own in your own apartment and got all that kind of stuff, they're going to move into a situation where they uh, um, gather around you, you know, uh, and that kind of thing. So, uh, uh, and, and protect you during this. And it is, again, quite common for there to be similar things like not all again there's you know so much plurality in our marriage practices but for many people in the west you know the and and especially traditionally it it was quite common for your family to talk to you about your responsibilities as a married person right um this was actually when most people got the sex talk believe it or not was the night before their wedding um they would sit down the father would sit down with his son the mother would sit down with her daughter, uh, the two people that were going to get married, and they would say, listen, not, obviously separately, right, not together. And they'd say, listen, this is what's going to happen on your wedding night. And I'm going to I'm here to tell you about it, you know, uh, and, and, and I'm going to let you know uh, what's going on here, you know, uh, and those kinds of things. And they would talk about sex and they would talk about physical intimacy and they would talk about this kind of stuff. Right. Um, and so they would be given this kind of advice. It was quite common for, again, other family members to come forward to them and say, listen, you're about to be a husband. Let me tell you what a good husband is. You're about to be a wife. Let me tell you what a good wife is. And so there was this time when they were being, the, the, during this liminal phase, you're being educated about what your new status entails. And the next day, they go and there's all these particular sort of micro rituals within this bigger ritual from where people sit and how they dress and the music that is played and the order in which they stand and the words that are said and all of these different things right um, become these different kinds of rituals and then words are said right and magically you are a different status now now you are married we have said the right words okay um, and again, there's physical markers of this. You will wear a ring. You will remove the veil. Um, the father will give the, the daughter to the new man, these kinds of things, right? And so there's all of these rituals that take place within this bigger ritual, right? But again, you, you see these really similar kind of things. Well, let's talk about Christmas for just a minute, right? Uh, the most wonderful time of the year, the song tells me. Uh, I do love Christmas, and it's a wonderful, wonderful ritual. And again, it's a rituals upon rituals upon rituals, right? Um, some of which we understand and some of which we don't, right? Um, the rituals that surround Christmas um, are complex and, and, and in many cases very, very old, okay? So let me first say that um, there is a myth in our culture that literally no religious scholar supports, not your priest, not your rabbi, not whoever, right? Uh, but this is, the, you know, um, uh, that Christmas is when the Messiah of the Christian religion, who is called Jesus Christ, was born. Literally every priest and, and Christian scholar will tell you that's utter nonsense. If you read the Christian Bible, Jesus was quite clearly born in the spring in that story um, because there is newborn uh, livestock in the barn, the position of the stars um, in the sky, the fact that they were going home, they were going to their birth home for the census that took place in the spring. Everybody literally knows that this is not when Jesus was born. Um, rather, this is actually a holiday that is pagan in origin. The reason it happens on December 25th is because there was a little bit of a mistake in the calendar. It should have happened a few days before on the winter solstice, which, if you don't know your astronomy very well, is the shortest day of the year. So on the shortest day of the year, um, peoples in Northern Europe, would pagans in Northern Europe, uh, among them Druids, uh, but a, a lot of other pagan religions, uh, who were primarily nature worshipers, right? They believed in a kind of animism um, that we just discussed, um, that there was power in inanimate objects and different things. Uh, they were horticulturalists, they were farmers, and they were very, very knowledgeable about the natural environment. They were able to measure the, 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 the solstice, right? And the, the winter solstice is the shortest day of the year. And so it was seen as a time that could be kind of dangerous because the sun is uh, metaphysically or, or symbolically dying. The days are getting shorter. 
we need to celebrate the sun because without the sun our crops don't grow without the warmth we will freeze we need the sun to come back and so we need to celebrate nature we need to encourage it to return in some way and so we use lights at the time candles and bonfires to remind the sun of how much we liked it of, of, of how much we needed the light and the warmth and the heat so that it would come back right it's also what, what we refer to as a we were talking about rites of passage or rituals of, of passage this is a ritual of inversion when the normal order of things has been twisted so the normal order of things is that there's you know daylight but now the sun is dying and so the night is taking over right likewise we would do things that would mimic that inversion by putting things where they didn't belong right inversion switching things so you put lights outside where they don't belong and you put trees inside where they don't belong right and so it was an inversion of the normal order of things right um you could eat too much you could let children stay up you could drink too much and yell and scream and act out and do these kinds of things which you can't normally do but the the normal order has been flipped the tree thing too by the way it was there's a reason that we always picked an evergreen right a conifer because it was a symbol of growth and fertility this thing is green and healthy even in winter time that life will come back the sun will come back the seasons will turn and we need to encourage that right uh and so there's all of these rituals that go back for a very very long uh time with that right and then of course these get um superimposed on things after uh christians came to and the church came to dominate europe the church quite smartly as they did with most holidays said okay cool you guys are really into this and you would not like us if we took this away so we will let you have this thing but we want you to know that actually what you're celebrating is the birth of jesus christ and not trying to encourage the son to keep living i'm simplifying and everybody went okay cool that's fine as long as i get my tree as long as i get to drink too much and eat too much and not work and stay up late and give gifts and receive gifts and do this stuff that we don't normally do and have big bonfires and put lights outside as long as i get to do that that's fine right and so it's stuck around and the idea of it being jesus's birth was just superimposed on top of it again we could talk forever and ever and ever and this is already a long video about all of the rituals that you have surrounding um christmas today in terms of the food that you eat and the gifts that you give um and and all of this kind of stuff right again it's a ritual inversion where the normal order of things are inverted and changed and it's not like other times of the year and all of this kind of stuff right um and so i'm sure you guys can understand your own and, and reflect on those right so lastly uh let me mention you guys have a couple of films that i'd like you to watch this week um and these films include um uh um one by e evans pritchard about his work among the azandi um in africa and his understanding of uh practices that they have surrounding uh, ritual belief and magic and its impact and the other one that i want you to watch is actually about shamanism among native american groups and the cultural appropriation of many of those shamanistic practices and why it's kind of problematic and how these things that are extremely meaningful to a culture and are uh, extremely important get co-opted and changed by people that don't understand their significance or their meaning or their purpose or their function and instead just strip all of it it is what i would compare if you are a christian to saying uh somebody came in uh and took the sacramental wine but rather than understanding that that's supposed to be the blood of jesus and drinking to honor him is like sweet free bottle of wine i'm gonna go get drunk that would probably make you really really mad that's very disrespectful to your belief structure so too unfortunately you're seeing something very similar happening among frankly white people <laughs> of european descent with native american beliefs right so check those videos out i think you're going to enjoy them and i will see you next time thank you everyone